Hello and welcome to the She Clicks webinar about artistic editing of images. I'm Angela Nicholson and I'm the founder of She Clicks. First, let's have a word from our sponsor. This webinar is sponsored by Lensbaby, the manufacturer of hand-built creative lenses that enable special effects such as velvet suite, edge and swirl in camera, freeing you to deliver your vision and connect with your photography in a deeper and more meaningful way. Okay, so that's enough from me. Let's hear from our speaker, Janie Lazenby, who is an artist, an educator, and who runs courses on Photoshop fundamentals and creative inspiration. Hi, Jane, how are you? Hi, Angela, thank you very much. I'm very well, and I am looking forward to some messy play. <laughs> okay. It is gonna get fun. I have raided the kitchen cupboard already. Great, well, over to you then. Thank you. So guys, tonight we're going to be playing seriously quite, quite getting dirty. I want to show you how to create some textures. Textures is a beautiful way to add an artistic vibe to your images. Do you need any artistic ability? Absolutely none. You can get the kids involved or you can get the grandkids involved. What I'm going to do to start with, I'm going to show you some finished images so that you can get a feel of the sort of thing we're going to create. Then I'm going to get my store cupboard essentials out and I'm going to create a camera. Then we're going to get the photographs of what I've created and do a live edit. Use them directly on some images. You might need a pen and paper if you want to make some notes, but the whole process is really good fun and it's pretty easy as well. So I'm gonna share my screen now and I'll show you a few images that have already been created. So here we've got a studio shot and I've enhanced the existing backdrop with a texture. Another one, this was a, an old rugged, uh, bit of a ruin actually behind this young girl. I've put a texture in to smooth it out and to give depth. Now, some of these textures, they look like expensive backdrops, don't they? You don't need to spend any money at all to have this look. You can have it behind anything, any subject. You'll get that lovely painterly feel or a little bit of depth, or you can use this texture to cover up elements you don't want to be there. It can be used very subtly, just to give that slight feel, or you can use it much more solidly here in the fine art portrait. You can create a myriad of effects. I love using the textures because it just gives that little bit of softness. So let me stop sharing. Let me get my little bit of a secret. This is my secret weapon, a white piece of cardboard. In fact, it's black one side or white at the other. And I'm literally, I'm gonna have a little bit of a playtime with you. So I'm gonna start by getting my gravy. This is the only brush I am going to use, which of course is a pastry brush. And I'm gonna flip my camera and do a little bit of live texture making. So here we go. You'll see, first of all, I have a protective piece of cardboard. And I'm going in with the gravy. I really am going in and just smearing it. When I said messy play, I wasn't joking. The idea of not using art materials, it's a good one, isn't it? A lot of us, we don't have art materials in the home. And the second that you start to use gravy or a little bit, of soy sauce. You're no longer scared, are you, to get your fingers in? You, you're no longer worrying about, is it going to look good? Because it so doesn't matter. Now that already, I mean, it smells wonderful, actually. That's ready to give a painterly background. It is that easy. I would put this now on one side. Just let me tip my light away so you can see a little bit better. I'll put that on one side to dry and I'm going to have a go at maybe more of a painterly one. I've got some kiwi leather shine 
it doesn't matter if it's kiwi or whatever it is. But this is as near painting as we get. I'm wanting something that's loud, it's busy, we've got brush strokes. This will be wonderful. I know just the image to put this on. I'm going to try some hair dye. I mean, maybe you don't all have wacky colours of hair dye, but maybe you do. If you're worried about your fingers, obviously you can wear gloves. But I find getting my hands in is way more exciting. Look at these beautiful textures. Now this might just look way out. You might be thinking there is no way any of these will be any good. Well, you'll be surprised. The deal is layering. I use more than one texture and I add them around an image. Now that one is ready now as well. I've got a lovely bit of depth. I've maybe one or two bits of white card. I really am just getting my hands in there and giving them a rub down. So the different types of textures you can create are amazing. So let me bring a little bit more light in there. I'll show you a few finished ones. So this really is a blue Peter. Here's them I did earlier. This is ink and coffee. And all I've done is got a washing up sponge, turned it over and dabbed. And I've got this beautiful, very intricate effect. Another one I've made here, this is just gravy. I mean, that is the most beautiful Italian wall feel, isn't it? That would be really good for a portrait. And here we've got some children's paint scrubbed on with a big brush. So we're not talking beautiful. We're not talking that you need to have a talent with a brush either. And certainly if gravy is all you've got, you can certainly go with that. So let's have a look at some of the photographs of the textures that I've created. I'm going to show you textures like a piece of stone wall, maybe a piece of paper. So it's not just out of the kitchen cupboard, but you can get such an amazing variety. So I'll just share the screen through. Just bear with me a second. I've got some really surprising ones. Ones that I know you are going to love. So concrete, just a piece of concrete. This will give a hand painted fine art feel to a portrait. And it's just a piece of stone. These could be mobile phone photographs as well. These don't need to be any specialist lens. Now, oat crackers, my favourite. I could just take a lovely little crop out of the edge of this oat cracker. And that is going to give me a wonderful texture as well. It seems bizarre that we've got all of these things in our cupboard and we've never photographed them. This is a dirty window with old vegetation that's grown up against the side of it. This would be really good for sort of giving a mystical feel to an image as well. This is coffee. It's slightly out of focus, but I quite like that. I like the way they've got areas that are in focus and areas that are out. What I would do with these images, they're completely untouched. I'd crop them. I'd give a little bit of a crop to get rid of that uneven edge. This is the second layer of coffee and it's got these beautiful bits of movement and energy. I mean, did you realise that Painting with coffee and painting with gravy granules is just as good as painting with real art equipment. This is my kitchen tile. So while I've been grubbing around in my kitchen, I've done the tiles, I've done the oven, I've done the oven tray. This is a big piece of stone outside my front door. And this texture is gorgeous. It's really meaty. It'll give some really good effects in the background you could use it to create a very painterly feel to break up the image as well now if you can't quite picture 
what these are going to look like. We are going to use these images in the second half in the, in the live edit. So you'll be able to see what the oven door looks like. Now, to be honest, my oven door usually isn't quite this good, but I did cook Sunday lunch in it and I made sure that I didn't clean the front of the glass down because I've got this beautiful splatter effect. I put a piece of dark colored paper under the glass door to make it a little bit more shadowy. And I think this is my new favorite as textures go. Now, do you take these photographs in focus or do you blur them? So you can do either. This is a blurred oven door. This is the same shot, but obviously in focus. So you can get more than one texture from a surface. Now, oven trays, baking trays, baking sheets, whatever you call them. This is a really old one and it's got an amazing color. This is actually the bottom of the sheet because the inside where we put the food, obviously that's gonna be clean. But if you turn it over, you might find there's a little bit more patina, shall we call it, on the bottom. So this is the almost in focus image. And then I played with the manual focus on the lens and I got this is beautiful bokeh feel. This will look amazing for a landscape. And I took it a little bit further, took it out of focus a little bit more. And we've got this lovely softness. So that light in the middle could help light a subject. There's lots of ways to be able to use them. Now, this is my living room wall. That's all it is. It's like painted lining paper. So it will give the feeling that you have printed on fine art paper when you apply it to your image. Now, this is the um, shoe polish from earlier. And then with the shoe polish, I then added a blue shoe polish on top. So you've got the movement, you've got the swirls. In fact, we've still got a wet bit here because it's still not quite dry. But again, with the crop, you've got a wonderful texture to be able to work with. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to put a few of these textures together in Photoshop. The software that you need to be able to work in this manner, you could do this with Affinity, Elements, GIMP or Photoshop. Now I'm a Photoshop user, but what I'm going to do is create a texture with two or three layers of the photographs I've taken. So I'm going to show you how to prepare them and how to get them ready to use. So I'm going to take you through into my Photoshop screen. I've just got an image here that is ready to go, but let me go and open some of these. We've got some really fun ones. So what are we going to have? We need the oven. In fact, let's have both ovens. Let's have some old stone as well. Let me open these up and let's see what we get. So this is one of the out of focus oven images. I'm literally going to create a stack of textures. Let me open up our other oven. Now I'm going to drag this texture or this photograph on top of the other. So I need to make sure that I am in the move tool because I want to place it on top. In Photoshop, there are so many different ways to do the same thing. I could embed, I could cut and paste. I prefer to move with the move tool. Now, can you see the cursor has changed? That tells me that I'm in the move tool. I'm on a mouse. So I just simply put my left click down and drag up until I get the other image, drag down, and then I lift my left click. I'm going to drag it down to fit. And I want to make this top layer a little bit transparent. And that's so I can see that layer underneath. Now there's all sorts of ways. Again, I can do that. I'm going to just drop the opacity and bring this slider down until it starts to merge with the layer underneath. Now I'm going to carry on and I'm going to do another one. Let me open again. What are we going to use? I think we need the gravy and coffee. Let's open this one. 
I'm going to give this a little crop. So I've gone into the crop tool, dragged over, double click. It looks like it is no way going to match, but it will. Into the move tool, left click down, and I'm dragging it up to my dirty oven and out of focus bit. I've lifted that left click, and now I need to get it to fit. So it's a little bit like making a sandwich, isn't it? Another piece in and another piece in. So to get it to fit, I need to do the transform uh, command. So control or command T will give me these little edges, which will allow me to pull it to fit. I'm just gonna take it a little bit over the edge and a double click. Now I'm going to use a different method now to make this sink into that layer below. I'm going to use a blend mode. Now there are 27 blend modes. They're pretty funky. They're really good. And you'll find them over in the right where it says normal. Let me click here. There you go. So as I run down, you should be able to see, there we go, how these blend modes start to change the opacity and how they make it all move together. Now, which one do we want? It's just down to your personal preference. I wanna come back up. I like that one the best. So this is now a complete texture. I've, I've blended three layers together. So sometimes people find it hard to work out that one layer of gravy isn't just gonna be the right texture for your image. It's a combination of different layers together. So if I now want to save this as a texture that I can use on an image, one of the things I need to do, I've got three layers, I need to flatten it down. So I'm gonna go up to the top left to layer, and I've got a drop down and right at the bottom of there is flatten image. Now, once I've clicked this, you'll see those three different photographs blend down just into the one. There you go. Now, I think we're ready to have a go at using this texture. I would probably work through all my gravy and my bits of shoe polish and have, you know, a rainy weekend. I'll have a nice coffee, a biscuit and a texture session and just see what I can create by blending textures through. But the fun bit starts when we start to apply them to an image. Now this is straight out of camera. It's a last light background that has seen better days. There's a mirror behind that's giving it a gleam. It's uneven. I've got varying stains down one side. It's ideal, isn't it? To make it more beautiful, to elevate it by adding your own texture to it. So the first thing I'm gonna do is give it a crop. Just make it a little bit neater. Now the idea of using that move tool to move a texture on top of another texture, that is gonna be the same method that I use now. I'm going to get my gravy and coffee. Uh, which one was it? Here we are, this one. I'm gonna go into the move tool left click down and then I'm going to drag it up onto our image where are we here we go and then drag it down and I'm ready to drop so to drop again I simply lift up that left click now how on earth is this going to work so I need to rotate don't I I need to get my gravy and coffee to fit so again a control or a command T gives me these little pull points. I can swing it round and drag it on top and do a double click. So I'm going to go for the easy way. So I'm hoping just to use a blend mode to allow this texture to colorize the background. There are more advanced ways of working, which we're going to cover tonight as well, so that we give you a really good grounding what to do with your gravy stained piece of cardboard. So I'm going to go where it says normal, click here and simply move down in the blend modes. 
some blend modes are not going to give you much of a result but you'll be surprised as you move down the difference that you get now this is the sort of background i would like you can see though it's changed the color on my model hasn't it it's changed to skin color so i'm carrying on moving through to see what starts to happen The blend modes will call, cause color changes. Each blend mode will cause a different type of transparency. Now the blend modes themselves are mathematical equations that make the texture, um, make the properties of the texture different. It doesn't change the image underneath. It just changes how we look through that transparency of the texture. And it's a non-destructive way of working. You might be thinking, oh my word, this is horrible. Well, it isn't quite the right one for this image. So I'm going to continue moving up and down to find the one that I do like. Now I'm going to settle with this image. I'm going to drop down the opacity of that texture layer. And you'll see I start to recover a little bit more of the skin tone. There's one or two elements from the background that are still going to shine through. It is a transparent layer. It's not fully opaque, so it isn't going to take out everything that you can see. What I am going to do is to click on that background and I'm going to remove these little elements. Very quickly, I'm going to use the patch tool which means I can draw around them and just drag them to another element. Now that was really easy, wasn't it? Very quick, very clean. But how are we going to work at getting back our skin tone? So I'm going to use a mask. So a mask is a non-destructive way of making a hole in that texture layer. And a mask allows you to change your mind as often as you want and to add back in or to take back out. So to make a mask, we need to go down into the bottom right. You have a whole host of icons. Now, let me tell you which icon it is without pointing at it. It's the one that I'm going to make a hole in the middle of the image with. It's this one here. So it, it's sort of quite self-explanatory. It's an easy one to remember. I have to be on my texture layer that I want to make a hole in when I click it. And there we go. Nothing actually has happened. What we need to do now is to either paint on it with painting media, or I can send a selection to it. So we could ask Photoshop to select and mask or I could just paint out the skin. So I'm gonna show you how this mask works. It's a white mask. So I'm gonna come over and I'm gonna use the painting out the skin option. So I've picked the brush tool. I have to make sure my brush is black because my uh, mask is white. And this is the exciting bit. I never tire of how exciting this is. I just paint back. I just reclaim she looks so pale, but this is what our original image is like. So we can adjust this brush to have an accurate edge or a soft blended edge. If I'm doing a quick mask like this, the hard bit is to make sure that you do get through to those edges. So the first thing to do in this circumstance is to go into the zoom tool go up to the top, click the plus, and let's go in. At the moment, she looks like she has interesting sunburn. So again, I'm going to select the brush tool. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller. And I need to show you up in the top left, this really useful uh, brush preset picker. I just call it the brush box. It gives you the chance to change the edge of the brush and to change the size and also to select the type of brush that you want. 
I'm just going to paint through. And it's a weird feeling that you are painting with the brush tool in Photoshop, but you're painting away the texture. We are going to go on to show you how Photoshop's select and mask works. But first of all, we need to troubleshoot. What happens if I've made a mistake? What am I gonna do? So it's a non-destructive way of working. So the really good thing is I just go down to that bottom left and I change my black brush for a white brush. Don't worry, nobody's watching, nobody's seen it. I'm just gonna make it go a little bit smaller. So I'm using the bracket keys, just quickly shimmy in. I can change back into the black and I'm back taking off as though nothing has ever happened. I think it is very important to know what to do when things go wrong, because then you have a toolkit to get yourself through an edit. I'm not going all the way through for our hem. I'm gonna go a little bit more on the back. The hem is called Missy, and apparently she has met Camilla. She's been on TV, so of course that is why. We're taking her uh, to she clicks today. So a quick way of fixing any little bits that go wrong is to hit the X on the keyboard and the X will allow you to paint back over. Hit the X and it will allow you to take back off. So we're almost there. I am going to do a little bit of lightning and we can have a look at how this image is ending up. Let's zoom out. We're not fully adjusted as yet, because now we can use this top layer where it has got the texture on, and we can drop a little bit of the opacity. Now, if I take it completely down, that's how we are in the beginning. So I can now, come up degrees by degrees and wait until I feel I've got the right color balance for my model. Now, once you've started working like this, it becomes a lot quicker. It becomes a lot easier. You have little difficulties like little internal negative shapes, difficulties of edges of hair, but you'll find that you become quicker and slicker. Now, what I am going to do is a big soft brushwork area over the hole, just to give a little bit more lightness in the middle. So I need to make sure I click on this mask and I choose the brush. So I'm wanting almost like a center lightness that makes the texture look like it acts as a vignette. So it brings the eye into the lighter areas in the middle. So to do that, I need to make a very weak brush and a very large brush. So I need that little brush preset picker that I talked about earlier. So I click up here, I get the brush box. I want a soft brush. I want a big brush. I also want to change the opacity to make it weak. So what I'm going to do now, just making the brush slightly larger, is just adding that little bit of lightness. This is a little trade secret. It stops her looking cut out and it blends her in. So that's our first edit with our coffee and gravy and oven door. I think that oven door bit really made that texture. So I'm going to move on to another image, one that's got a different challenge. Let me close this one here. I'm going to close my oven door. And let's look at another image. Now, I love to use these textures for images that have got a problem. Now, I also have a problem in life that I hate ironing. I really hate ironing to the extent I don't own an iron or an ironing board. So my backdrop here is in need of help. So I'm going to add 
a texture, I'm probably going to add the oven door and maybe that beautiful piece of stone from earlier. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask Photoshop to do the mask for me this time. It's a little bit more complicated, isn't it? There's a lot more elements to the image. So I'm going to go now, let's open up our little bit of old stone. Now, why am I thinking old stone? It's because what I'm trying to mimic is an old master painting. And I've got a backdrop. This would be beautiful if it was a crumbling old stone interior of a castle or some beautiful old fashioned cottage. So my mind goes to what is the nearest thing we can shoot that would fit with this image. And I think this old stone, I think that's going to be perfect. In fact, maybe I use this by itself rather than combining it with another image in the beginning. So let's do the same procedure. Move tool, left click down. I have to remember which one of these images I'm working on. There we go. I drag back in and you can see that little white square with the plus. That's telling us that it's carrying a texture. And now I lift my left click and we've got the stone. I'm going to position it at the top and again, do control or command T. It gives me these little pull points and just pull it down and get it to fit. Now I'm going to try a blend mode. I've no idea what this image is going to look like with this texture. So let's have a little sort of preview. I'm going to use the live preview that Photoshop gives us. So once I've opened up the blend modes, I simply roll down. Now look at that background. That's the perfect castle interior, isn't it? It looks really in keeping with the costume, that whole old master vibe. Am I gonna try any of the others? Well, we might find one that's better. So I need to keep going down. You will find you completely lose the image. Or oh, the image is too bright. It becomes too fussy or it clouds over. I still think that first, first one was the one. I am wanting, I have to remember to cover up the lack of ironing ability in the background. Now that's a nice one as well. I have a little bit of the light and dark, so I can still see where the creases are, but that's not too bad. So again, it's losing it towards the end. I'm gonna come back to that first one. I am going to drop the opacity. So if I drop the opacity, I'm making that stone layer slightly transparent or slightly more transparent. I want to get the right level because I can see some of these creases are going to come back and haunt me. So we're now going to do a mask, but I've shown you how to do a hand mask. I've shown you how to paint on by hand. And that's what we often call hand masking. Now I'm going to show you how to do a select and mask, or more importantly, how to make Photoshop do it, because we don't want to do all of this work ourselves all of the time, do we? So I'm going to turn off that texture layer and I'm going to click onto my background. I'm going to go up to select at the top left. Now, Photoshop sometimes does the most amazing select and mask. And sometimes I always joke that Photoshop's been to the pub and then is trying to do a selector mask. And sometimes it's not quite as good as you would expect. Let's have a go. So I come down to select a mask and click. Now, the first thing you'll notice, everything has gone blue. This is OK because this is my mask color. I've got that set on the top right of your screen. So how on earth am I going to do this? I could just click select subject at the top and sit here with my fingers crossed that Photoshop, whoa, is going to do a cracking job. Do you know what? That's not bad. But Photoshop, I need you to do the chair and do the sewing box. So I'm going to go at this point into 
the object selection tool. So this is the fourth one down on the left. This is our get me out of jail free. I click on that and I am going to draw over where the chair is and say, come on, Photoshop, have a go. Has it done the chair? Let me move away. It's still struggling a little. Let me give it another nudge and see if it will do this. So I find sometimes that Photoshop is extremely helpful and other times it can be particularly stubborn. Now, as I go over, can you see things light up blue? When they light up blue, I click on them and that should mask them through. But Photoshop again is deciding it's not quite on form. So we'll do a little bit of a push it along. I'm going to go into that third brush down from the top left, which is just the brush tool. I'm going to add to my mask. So I go into that plus and I'm pretty much going to take the table out. And I'm doing a rough cut. I always like to say it's like saying, come on, Photoshop, do your homework again. You've not spent long enough. I go into mother mode when Photoshop doesn't quite perform. So we've got these rough edges. So I ask it to refine the edge. So we've got the refine edge brush tool. This is pretty much where I say, come on, do your homework again. I click on that and I want to draw over the edges. Can you see it recalculates, it goes back and it looks at that area again. I've got a little bit of a gap there. Let me paint over. It could be better Photoshop, but at least you're playing ball. Let's go around the edge of the chair. Now this works better if you do a little bit by a little bit. You don't try and go all the way around in one and hold your breath. That in a way is asking for Photoshop to forget what it's doing. Now that's better. Let's look in detail. Now, often when they show you what Photoshop can do, it does it in one click. Everybody's happy. Isn't that brilliant? It's a massive time save and off we go. This is the reality. This, this is, it often does it quite well and then it often lets you down. So I'm going to go back into the brush tool and I'm actually going to ask it to recalculate here again, but I'm wanting to put the mask further so at this point I go into the minus and it does take a while to get used to what's plus what's minus where does it work but remember if you go wrong you simply do a control z or a command z and it takes you back and that's really interesting to know that there is never really a proper big mistake that you can't rescue with photoshop so I'm painting over the areas that it didn't do particularly well. Have we got an area here? So again, if I'm in the plus, I am extending my mask. If I am in the minus, I am bringing that color of the mask in. Nice, slow, steady work will give you the best result. Now we've got a blocky edge. What on earth has happened here? So this is where your refine edge tool hasn't worked quite well enough. I'm going to use a little bit of manual adjustment down here. I'm coming down with the brush on plus. I'm simply then gonna swap it to minus and then I'm bringing that background edge through. Just going to trim this down a little bit more. So it's an ideal time to take your time. Obviously, when you're doing a demonstration, for you guys, it's a little bit like watching the kettle boil, isn't it? You can probably see the tiny imperfections, but it could take a long time to get that perfect. Let's have a zoom out. Before we then apply that mask 
any further, we've got to look for where there can be mistakes or little bits that are going to show. One of the things that always seems to catch me out are these internal shapes. Once you pan out, you can see them. So we need to go back in and can you see here, we've got that negative shape that Photoshop again has missed. So back into that refine edge tool. And I'm simply gonna paint over that area and have my fingers crossed. Now Photoshop hasn't done a bad job. Again, I need to refine that edge. I'm in the plus, so I'm extending. I like simply come down and fix that. But have you seen something else that has happened? While I'm busy working here, it's readjusted itself and changed a selection that was good. So Photoshop has definitely been out tonight and has got a little bit of wickedness in its eye. So I'm just painting down just to straighten that back out. Now, can you see what is happening here? I've got a very hard brush and I'm using a mouse. And even though I'm on a mouse mat, I'm having a little ripple effect. So what I can do is just to use the mouse up and down a little bit, rather than doing a long drag, just going over, or often being on a higher magnification helps as well. But this repetition is good. Now with a corner, I overdo a corner because it's way easier then to make a good corner. So that's a nice little tip. Let's again come out. Are we ready? I'm dying to get this stone on here. Oh, we've got an edge here as well. So into the refine edge tool. Now it does seem to be taking a long time. Some people always prefer to do a hand mask and to paint away that texture themselves. Other people really, you know, don't want to work that way and want to stay with what Photoshop gives us. So whichever is your poison, keep doing it. So, okay, I think we're ready. So you'll see there's a lot of adjustments that you can make on the right hand side. How on earth do you work your way through this? I often think if you click one on and you look and see what the change is, it tells you whether you want to keep it or whether you want to click it back off. I tend to shift my edge to the left and this means the selection is a little bit tighter. So I'm going to export. Export to new layer and click OK. I'm going to turn on that background and it looks like nothing ever happened, but now we're ready to do the little bit of magic. I'm going to turn on this top texture and I'm just going to get hold of it with a left click and drag it below. And there we go. We've now got that lovely textured background. I can still change this little piece of stone, soften it down or take it back up. So there's all sorts of ways that we can create these textures, isn't there? To give all sorts of different types of results. I'm just going to move on and do one more. Now this one, I hope the select and mask will be fabulous. What will help you with a select and mask is to have a larger contrast. If you've got more contrast to the image, the uh, Photoshop calculations tend to be a lot cleaner. So I'm going to copy my base layer. I'm going to this time go to the object selection tool, which pretty much is the same way of doing it. And I'm going to draw a square or a rectangle over the dog. There you go. Now that was a lot less pain, wasn't it? Is it any good? Well, it could be better. It could most definitely be better. Can you see it's not quite got all of those edges? So what I am going to do, I'm going to go into that select and mask with that selection and do a really quick nip around the edge. 
Now what should happen is these dark elements of the background that you see between the dog's fur, that Photoshop calculates those and removes them. And this is happening way quicker. Obviously Photoshop now has had a coffee and he's feeling more on form. So I am still gonna output to a new layer with a layer mask. So now I can open any texture and slip the texture underneath this dog. So are we gonna do the stone again? The gravy? Oh, we're gonna to have to do the oven, aren't we? Oven door, here you go. So I'm gonna drag it up, drag it down, lift my left click. Don't worry because we just drag this below the dog. Now this starts to look a lot quicker and a lot easier. Photoshop can struggle with the more complex objects, but when you've got a simpler, more contrasting piece, it grabs it and it runs. So I'm hoping this has given you some inspiration, not only to make your own textures, but to have a completely different look when you go into that kitchen cupboard, a different purpose. You know, that old soy sauce that you've not used for years. This is the best use for it. And I'm hoping also it gives you the ideas to rework images. Images like this, it's got an appalling background, hasn't it? It really could do with that little bit more work. So I don't know if we've got some questions that have come in, but I'll come through from the main room and see if we can answer any questions. I'll come back through to you, Angela. Great. Thank you very much, Jane. That was really good. One of the interesting things about Photoshop is you did mention it, that there's a lot of different ways of doing the same thing. And very I think much, yeah. a, a lot of people, when they start, find it easier to kind of go along the, um, the menus and finding the options. But when you do that, you will actually see the shortcuts as well, don't you? You can see which keys you need to hold down to get those. And that once you start using the shortcuts, it's, it get, becomes quite intuitive. You just need to sort of like every day try a new one and gradually build up and build up and you get more familiar, don't you? And I think when, when you repeat the same thing again, when you start working with textures, you are always dragging a texture on. You're always moving the texture around. So they'll start to become second nature as well. Okay, uh, someone's saying that the explanation was so clear and so good that they don't have any questions, which is very nice. Um, someone has said, would you mind just explaining how you mask the dog again? please. Okay, so I asked Photoshop, I used the uh, object selection tool to draw a rectangle over the dog, partly because the dog was an isolated subject. And I asked it to make a selection, the selection wasn't brilliant. So I just took it back into select and mask from that top menu. And it does a lot of work for you. Some images Photoshop is amazing. Other images like the image of my mum playing at being Rembrandt, it struggled with that. But I'm quite glad it struggled with that because if we think you're meant to do one click and it does it, you're very disillusioned when Photoshop doesn't. So at least I've shown you all a way of getting around that. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, a question from Facebook. Um, do you routinely use a mouse or do you use a tablet or do you use um, something else, another sort of editing? I went and bought myself a really nice tablet and pen and I'm, here I am using my mouse. Um, <laughs> I have great intentions, but I slip back into using the mouse so much when I'm doing more of the admin side. Um, I don't like doing admin side trying to get my pen and tablet and once I've disconnected it it's like two weeks later I remember and I'm just zooming along on my mouse so for me the majority of the editing I do is mouse um, I do have a trade secret that my table that I work on here is melamine so I have six foot of mouse pad I never get to the end of my mouse pad and I never fall off the edge and that certainly helps um, someone has said that they missed the bit where you were talking about creating a soft blended edge, which you said was a trade secret. Yes, yes. Shall I review that? 
Shall I go back and review Thank you. If we've got the image still there, let me share my screen back. I don't know if I let that image go. Yeah, I think I did. Let me show you on this image. So a soft blended edge, if your subject looks cut out and stuck onto your texture background, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to the mask. And at this time, the mask is, is either black or it's white. And I need to use a white brush. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to, it's like using a blusher brush. I'm just going to pat in the middle of the image and it's going to lighten this transition between your figure and your background. So I need to make the brush tool active. I'm in the white brush because this is a black mask. I don't know if you can see that big white circle line of the size of the brush, but this that, is that doesn't really actually show, subtle. unfortunately. Right. Zoom is sometimes a bit selective about what it shows. It is. But all being well, if I tell you, I'm going to say click and I'm going to click and all being well, you'll see a little bit of a light mm. click. Yeah. Click. So what I'm doing, I'm very selectively taking out the center of that texture only by a very small amount. I'm using a soft brush. So my brush edge doesn't leave a mark. It really fades through. And this is a way of sort of bedding it in together because a lot of people will say, my image looks cut out. It looks terrible. It looks like someone's had scissors and stuck it in the middle. And this is a way to sort of bring the two closer together and bring in a little bit more realism. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, done that. Oh, how do you create specific textures for each of your images, or do you have a library of them that you like to sort of use on a regular basis? You have particular favourites, perhaps. I have a library, and I have like rainy day days or possibly gin and tonic texture making sessions. Um, but you know, when you, you feel like doing something, but your creativity isn't about creating an image, I start combining textures and I save the good ones. I give them daft names. I save them as the highest quality JPEG I can. And then I come back and look at them and you do get a firm favorite very quickly. Now, I only took that stone photograph this afternoon. I already know exactly which images I want to use that with because I think it's beautiful. The, the sort of the age of it is absolutely gorgeous. But the idea of creating a combination of textures to make a master texture is that you can do five images of gravy. You can put your soy sauce with your gravy, with your, your shoe shine, and it doesn't have to be one perfect texture. You can really combine a number that make beautiful pieces to use. Um, someone is asking, is it only the newer versions of Photoshop that have things like objects uh, select? Yeah. Now, every time Photoshop updates over the last three or four years, that has been one of the main parts that has been worked on. And it's become very good. Well, it's very good for the white dog and appalling for the picture of my mom. But it is developing. Every update you get, that element carries on being upgraded. So the idea of the object selection tool, if you have an evenly shaped object, you can just put your cursor over, it'll select and mask. One click, you've got it. It's great for graphic design, but for people like me who like hairy beasts or hairy children, that masking of the edge isn't quite as automatic. Yeah, it's, um, it's using artificial intelligence, isn't it? It's, it's something mm. that's... A sort of really come to the fore in the last couple of years and, and maybe even more in the last 12 months, it seems to become a really prominent thing and it's developing faster and faster. Mm. And in order to do that, basically, it's having to, what the, the engineers would do is they would look at thousands of images and identify different things in that, you know, and to tell the software, this is, this is hair and this is background. And, you know, it's, it's kind of learning through this process. That's putting it in a very simple way. But, Sometimes um, it sort of guesses at an average, doesn't it, as yeah. well? And, yeah. and this is when I, I said sometimes Photoshop has been out late. 
it doesn't do a good guess. But again, <laughs> no. you can help the image by adding clarity to the image. So you can actually edit the image to give it a cleaner, harder edge for Photoshop to mask it better as well. So this is an interesting question. Where did you actually learn about these uh, Photoshop techniques? I'm self-taught. I, I, I sort of shadowed a couple of well-known photographers dying to find out how to do this. And you find a lot of people are amazing with their techniques, but they don't let all the secrets out. And I think once I'd sort of worked out a way to do it, I went into my own little bubble and I found a way that worked for me. Now, my background is as a painter. So I really like to do more elaborate paintings and, and actually paint elements like birds and clouds and put my paintings into my photography. But it's sort of a way that I've, I've really enjoyed sharing because it's very much on trend now is creative imagery. And I think there's nothing better that you find something that makes you happy, makes you really enjoy creating and you share it back out. Someone has just jumped in and said that they've got an older version of Photoshop. And while it doesn't have all the latest features, with your help, she's managed to find a way around um, Brilliant. a lot of those things. So that's great news. Now, Affinity users as well, you can do the same sort of thing. Your screen won't look exactly the same, but Affinity is, a, is capable of all of these edits as well. Yeah. And we do have a webinar about Affinity um, that actually it's just about to be it'll, i'll publish it tomorrow on you on uh, youtube and it'll go onto the website very soon uh right uh, this is an interesting question when might you use a black and white texture and why right so if i've got a texture and i love the surface i love what it does to my image but it gives a color cast it makes my uh, model's face too yellow or too red if i desaturate that texture I will still have the effect of the texture, but with none of the color effect. And also you can use the uh, contrast blend modes, which is overlay, soft light. They tend to sort of bring through a lot more of the texture surface. And if you just dial it down with the saturation, you've got a really useful second texture. Now, every texture we've created you can swap your layers and save it as another texture. You can make one layer um, black and white. You can make it all black and white. So from the one playing with gravy or playing with soy sauce, you probably get 30 different textures. So it is a, it's a definite rainy day activity. And um, I think this is the last question, but usually it means another couple jump in. Would you normally stick to JPEG or do you ever use RAW for textures? I shoot a texture with whatever I've got. Mm -hmm. So some of my textures are mobile phone. Um, I shoot in raw, um, in manual, normally. So if I'm happening, you know, walking down the street, I'll be shooting the road, the wall in raw. Mm -hmm. um, I think for storage, it's better not to store them all as raw and to store them as high-end JPEGs. And also to classify the our folders of really big, bold textures, our folders of ones that are grunge and scratchy, and then our folders of things like sand, which I can use to replace skin texture if I've got a blown highlight. So if you put them in different folders for the type of texture you, you've got, you'll find actually using them becomes a lot quicker as well. You're not searching 10, 15 minutes for that one texture that is somewhere. Janie, that was absolutely fantastic. I think, uh, as a few people have said, they've really appreciated what you, you've told them. And, you know, you've been very generous with your knowledge, but I think you've also done your pacing is brilliant. So it's you've made it easier for people to follow. So thank you very much for that. And everyone's really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I do a lot of tuition of Photoshop. So if anyone would like to join me, I do have an education site, which is ejlazenby.com. And I also do quite a few free challenges. So you may catch me doing one of my two or three times a year freebie editing giveaways. Excellent. Well, there will be some links when this goes on the website. There will be some links to um, connect with Janie. So thanks Thank very you. much. Enjoy the rest of your evening.
Okay, bye-bye. Bye.